So thank you, Archon and Dennis, for inviting me to this session. Um, I think this is great. And what I've tried to done is, is as this was part of our master courses at the 100 level, I've tried to take a step back and to think about this topic, not in as much detail, but, but how we should go about thinking about MeSH and when we should use it. So let me ask the audience, that, let's do a quick needs assessment. Let me ask you a question. How many people here get to use whatever mesh they want in their OF? Okay. How many people here have to use from a specific vendor that is contracted with their hospital? Okay. And how many people here know how they make that choice of which of those meshes on the shelf they're going to use today? See, Dr. Tofi definitely knows exactly what she wants to use. So when I talk to residents, when I do teaching, a lot of the time I ask people, what mesh do you want to use? And especially young surgeons kind of look at me blankly and say, well, whenever the attending wants. I'm like, well, how do you know what the attending wants? And so I think we need to have this discussion about how we're making these choices. So I have uh, no disclosures for this. OK, let's see. See if she'll play. Oh, can we have the audio? You know, if you've had surgical mesh implanted, co contact us, the lawyers. So, what are the risks, and like, do we need to be worried about the surgical mesh in the hernia operation? So we've seen a lot of the commercials that say, you know. Sorry. Okay. So, how many people have had that patient in their office? This is a big question, and, and I'm trying to really frame a lot of it from this point of view. Our patients are becoming more sophisticated, which is great, right? Um, so that patient was asking, does she really need mesh? And the spoiler alert is yes, and we're going to discuss some of that data. And we're also going to talk about ways to classify the mesh and think about it from kind of a, a macroscopic point of view. All right, so why is this topic so important and why am I so glad that Dr. Ramaswamy invited me? Well, because these are all questions I get from patients every day. And, you know, there are some of the people who come in are like, just fix me. But where I live especially, I sometimes get, you know, scientists who work at the NIH. We get really difficult questions. Um, my favorite question lately was the patient's wife who asked me if he would set off metal detectors now that he had a mesh in him. But people are confused. So we need to have these principles in mind in order to correctly talk to and guide the people in our office. And one of the things I learned from my mentor, who I think looks like he just left and just gave the talk before us, is that the best way to have a happy patient outcome is to have a really good discussion with them before the surgery and to talk through all these issues and to let them know what the potential bad things that can happen are. And if somebody's prepared for that, they're much more accepting of it if it does happen. But you need to know the answers to these questions. So we're going to see the answers to some of these. The what if I reject the mesh question we'll talk about later. That is a very common one. Here's another reason why you need to know this. J.B. Bittner, let me put this up here today. This was a text that one of his patients received, a spontaneous text. So lawyers are not only advertising on television now, they are somehow mining data and figuring out what patients have had mesh implanted, and they are aggressively going after those people. And if you've looked at any of the websites where they do, you know, lawyers unpacking mesh on live video, there's a lot of misinformation on those videos. All right, so why are we using this stuff, right? Why do we convince our patients that we need to put a piece of plastic in them and not just sew up the hole? So, all right, quick data alert here. But when we go back and look at some of the data from the 90s, we can see that there is a very high rate of incisional hernia occurrence after primary repair. So in this particular study, when they looked at um, an average date of about 36 months after the, or 30 months after the surgery, they found that a third of the patients had recurred. And you can see when they followed patients out even farther, up to 60 months, they were getting to a 41% rate of recurrence. So when over 40% of your patients are recurring, we have a technique problem. And if patients had previously already had a repair and recurred, that recurrence rate was even higher. So one of the best, uh, in, when they did a sub-analysis of this, they found that the size of the hernia 
does matter. So while we still have a really high rate of recurrence of small hernias, less than four centimeters of a quarter, larger hernias reoccur at an even higher rate. This is some summative data from a bunch of different papers looking at open ventral hernia repairs, and you can see the recurrence rate here varies from 18 to almost 50%. So essentially, it's like a roll of the dice. If we fix you, there's a chance 50-50 you're gonna have a recurrence. So we can say that primary ventral hernia repair had an unacceptably high rate of recurrence, even for small hernias, and so Enter step, mesh, stage right. Is mesh going to fix our rate of incisional hernias? Well, the most famous study, or, or at least one of the seminal studies from this came out of um, the Dutch group who looked at two groups, 200 patients, 100 in each group. One group had a standard mass closure, one centimeter bites, one centimeter apart. The other group underwent repair with a piece of standard heavyweight mesh at that time which had two to four centimeters of overlap and was run to the posterior fascia, so it wasn't fixated. Occasionally there was bridging. And when they looked at their patients at a time point of about two to three years out, you could see that the patients who had mesh, even with this technique, which today we would probably not call gold standard, that the mesh decreased the recurrence rate by half. And we had that 46% uh, recurrence rate that we saw in the slide just previously. So that's great, right? Reduced it by half. Because they have an excellent database and they have a small population, they were able to follow those patients out to 10 years. So this is some of the best data we have. They found 126 of the original 200 patients. And you can see that over time, a couple different things happened. Number one, the primary hernia rate increased, so it went from 23% to 32%. So over time, more and more patients are having recurrence. And we also saw that, again, that ratio held. The recurrence rate was twice as high in the group that had no mesh versus the group that had mesh. Uh, and we can also see just really how unacceptable the recurrence rates are. So a 63% recurrence rate with a suture repair 10 years later, you might as well have not had surgery if you're looking at odds. So just, just a recap slide, that's pretty significant data. And that's not the best repair we can do. So this group decided to look to see if we put all the randomized control data together, what kind of an outcome we could get. They found 11, um, trust papers, which was 10 trials. So they put the patients from the 10 trials together and they, you know, ran it through the magic group analysis calculator. And what you can see is a pretty strong uh, risk ratio in favor of mesh. So there's a risk ratio of 0.36 with a very tight interval. And I, had, I did the math on this because I am not so good with these, but it's a 64% reduction in the risk of having a hernia by using mesh. So when someone sits in your office and says, do I really need a piece of mesh in me? We have pretty good data, at least right now, that says, yes, you do, because it's gonna significantly reduce your risk of a hernia reoccurring. All right, so that's what we tell this lady. All right, so next, what mesh are we gonna use? And I think, if you walked through the exhibit hall, you understand that this slide represents how overwhelming the choices are. So let's break it down a little bit into what's the DNA of mesh, what's the backbone, what do you need to ask someone who comes into your office and says, hey, I've got a great new piece of mesh for you. So permanent plastic materials, that has been the mainstay of what we've used. We honestly don't know how long a piece of mesh needs to be present in order to repair a hernia. But if you look at those studies I just showed where your hernia recurrence rate continues to increase over time, it does suggest that a permanent material might be what we need. So these are the big three, polypropylene, polyester, and polytetrafluoroethylene, or PTFE, and that's what most of our mesh is built off of right now. So the first thing when a, a representative of the company comes in and says, hey, I have a new mesh for you, ask, okay, which plastic is it? <laughs> 
things are getting more complicated. We not only have permanent plastic, we have reabsorbable plastic. So these things are um, now being combined in different ways with both permanent mesh, and we're making absorbable mesh out of these different plastics with different capabilities and different characteristics. And then finally, it's the biologic materials, which either have a uh, xenograft from an animal or a human allograft source. And again, they're coming from very different parts of the body with very different collagen structures and other materials inside. So, oops, sorry. Uh, polypropylene has always been the standard. You can see the evolution of some of the mesh over time. It has a carbon backbone, and on that backbone, there are methyl groups and hydrogen groups, which, if you think about it, is not particularly stable. If you did chemistry, a hydrogen group is pretty low energy and easy to break. When we look at it implanted, we can see here is a fairly um, dense material, and you can see the ingrowth of tissue on the scanning electron microscope around the different, uh, the different types of filaments and the interstices, and that's kind of a close-up. So that's what's happening inside when we implant this. And you can see that kind of thick reaction or scar tissue around the material itself. Lighter weight material, you get more normal tissue in between. You can see that zone of, of inflammation is now surrounded by more normal tissue. Polyester has also changed over the years. So this is an example of multifilament polyester. A lot, some of our materials are now monofilament, and we'll talk about that structure in a bit. But there have been groups in the past who have really talked about not wanting to use polyester, especially with these multifilaments, because if it, the bacteria did get there, it would be very difficult to dislodge them. And then finally, this is PTFE, which can be extruded in many different ways. It can be a solid with no pores on the surface. It can be solid filaments, or it can be this expanded version, which probably most people are familiar with, which is microporous with three micron pores on one side and 17 micron pores on the other side to allow for some degree of cellular ingrowth. All right, so if the plastic is the DNA, then the RNA is the design. And when you're thinking about the material, you want to talk about a couple of different characteristics. So first is what we call the pore, right? You hear about macroporous or microporous mesh. That is the area of interstices or openings between the filaments. Filament diameter and thickness and how the filaments are woven together. Some are woven, some are knitted, some are monofilament, some are dual, some are multifilament. The actual thickness of the mesh is another characteristic and the density or amount of foreign body is another. And you can see this is from a great paper that Corey Deacon put together when she was um, in the lab at Wash U, where she's a, a materials engineer, and no one had ever kind of put together most of the common meshes out there and looked at their structural characteristics. And you can see just in this photograph how different the materials just visually look that we're using every day. So she and Dr. Matthews had collaborated on that. And they looked at engineering principles, okay? So things like ball burst strength, elasticity, tear resistance, suture retention strength. And all of these are made up by the characteristics which I just spoke about. You know, each mesh has an individual characteristic. One of them is this, anisotropity. There was a very nice paper, uh, I think it was yesterday, in one of the hernia sessions, where again, the engineers looked at anisotropity and implanting it into the abdominal wall with two different meshes with two different amounts of stretch to see if when it was in a pig, if the stretch made a difference as to potential hernia repair. So people are starting to look at these characteristics and say, does it make an effect in our outcome? Here's a list of very common meshes. I am not going to promote one or the other. But for all those people here who raised their hand and said, I am limited by my hospital as to what mesh I can choose. Most people will have some variety at least, even when they're in that subgroup. And so how are you gonna select it? So you might want a heavyweight mesh, you might, might, might want a lightweight mesh, but you need to know how to find out what the characteristics of your particular meshes are. And in this same paper, Corey Deacon tried to give us some definitions to that. So they talked about what makes a mesh macroporous, right? Greater than two millimeters in terms of the size of the pore. A large pore was one to two millimeters. So we're trying to have some characterization of that. 
Also, what's heavyweight and lightweight? In the literature, we hear that thrown around all the time without some very good definitions. So again, trying to put some continuity on what an ultra lightweight mesh is, what's a medium weight, how do you know what to ask for? And then they did some testing and found that if you were concerned about certain characteristics like suture tear and pull out and the potential for a mesh under a lot of tension to tear, which meshes might be susceptible to that? Inflammatory response. I see Will Cobb and Will Hope in the back, and this comes from a paper that he put out quite some time ago now. But what we know is that the amount of foreign body is going to stimulate a greater foreign body response. And so those things that Sean talked about so nicely with your types of macrophages this morning, the more foreign material you've got, the more response, the more scar tissue. So smaller pores, thicker fibers, heavier density, all of those things is gonna stimulate that macrophage. And then we're gonna have a picture that looks like this on the histology, where you've got that zone of mesh host interaction with a lot of purple cells, a lot of inflammation. And when we take a close look at that, our macrophages have turned into these giant foreign body cells. You can see they've got like 30 nuclei in them, and essentially they're just pumping out toxins. Um, and so all of these chemicals are trying very hard to break down that mesh. And it can have an effect. I showed you the polypropylene with all of those hydrogen bonds. Well, when we look at some explanted heavyweight polypropylene, there is a tissue surface effect. We don't think it necessarily will affect the mesh response, but when we combined that inflammation, the scarring associated with it, the lack of abdominal wall compliance, all of these things are a potential concern when we think about putting them in a patient, and you can see the result of the chemical reaction on the mesh surface. So these materials are not inert. Nothing in our body is inert. But what I tell our patient who says, is, am I going to reject the mesh? I tell them I'm gonna use the least amount of foreign body I think you need to have a good repair. And that hopefully you won't feel it at a, you know, a, a larger level. Your body will know what's going on. But hopefully you won't have that inflammation, no nerve entrapment, no scarving, scarring. We saw with some heavyweight implants, that things like this would happen inside the body. They contract and, and we lose that potential effectiveness of the mesh covering a hole. And you go from a, you know, a pristine to a cleaned explant, which does not look the same. And this can be the effect in the patient. Mesh can shrink and mesh can migrate. And so I think this is why a lot of us moved away from heavyweight materials, although I'm seeing some people talk more and more about heavyweight materials at the time. But just keep in mind, if you cover a small defect with a mesh that might contract, you can get away with it, but if you cover a large defect without very much overlap on a mesh that might contract, you can see where that may expose your hernia and cause a recurrence. All right, so which mesh, where and when? Most of us will say that inside the abdominal cavity, we should use some kind of a coated or barrier mesh, and if it's outside of the abdominal cavity, it can be a, a bare mesh, although, a few people here at this meeting were talking about actually putting mesh up against uh, bowel, which I think is interesting. But those of us who have seen complications like this, it, it still makes us uneasy, I think. You know, the fistulas, and, and there's been lots of talks in past years that show all sorts of disaster photos, so I'm not going to expound on that. The meshes that have barriers can have a solid barrier, which is usually PTFE, or some kind of absorbable barrier. I took, when I was making this talk, I took several products off of this list which have recently come off the market. And I think we try to have good ideas about what a good barrier is, but you know, recently we've found that perhaps oxidized reduced cellulose is not a great barrier and some of those materials have now been pulled. So you have to always keep an eye on what your outcomes are and if you're happy. We now have synthetic absorbables. I think we're seeing people push these more and more. And I think a lot of us are struggling to figure out where to use some of these long-term synthetic resorbables in our patients. Maybe, you know, for somebody who's had an incarceration and you're worried about um, having some kind of bacterial extravasation, maybe this might be a time to use a, a mesh like that. It'll eventually go away. But um, we've seen, as we've become more facile with extruding different kinds of materials, we can change the characteristic properties a lot. There's also now partially absorbable mesh, 
We have biologic-derived partially absorbable mesh with a synthetic core. Instead of having plastic, it's a, uh, a small intestine submucosal coating. And this is our list of biologic materials, which is a rainbow of colors. And um, I think everybody has talked very, a lot about when and where to use biologics. Usually it's to get yourself out of trouble in a contaminated setting and best used if you can close fascia. We know now that bridging with biologics probably will lead to an eventual ventral hernia. If you get out of a, a bad situation, that's okay. You go back and fix it another day. But I think we've seen the use of biologics reduced a lot because of the cost and because we know if they're not used well, they're going to have recurrences. Each biologic also has very different properties. So whether it's made out of um, a pig dermis and it is cross-linked and there's very hard to have ingrowth, um, some of these go away very quickly and cells will um, essentially break down the mesh within three months. So understanding the characteristic of the mesh and choosing that on purpose is important. And again, this is just a list of all the different biologics. It's, it's overwhelming. So add in your biosynthetic resorbables, your now biologic antibiotic impregnated mesh. Um, we have a lot to choose from. But I think when you kind of take a step back, remember you've got the basic materials. How are those put together? Your degradable materials. And here's the list of what we have now, okay? Synthetics, partially absorbable, biosynthetic completely, biosynthetic partially, it, it just goes on. But it comes back to a few principles. Okay, so number one, just like a nice house, right? Location, location, location. I think a lot of us are still very reluctant to put an uncoated mesh up against bowel, so keep that in mind. Um, but if you're, a lot of people are now not doing an eye palm on purpose because they want to keep mesh out of the abdominal cavity. If you want to do that, use the right technique, which you'll hear about later. Environment. Choose the right mesh for what's going on in your repair. Is it a clean case or is it a disaster, right? So while there has been some evidence showing lightweight polypropylene is okay in um, a contaminated field, some people aren't comfortable with that. You need to make that decision for, for yourself, what your comfort level is as a surgeon. And finally, the inflammatory effect. Um, although there are a lot of people talking about concerns for lightweight meshes tearing, I would say keep a midweight mesh in mind as your standard mesh. You want to reduce inflammation. It is extremely uncommon, I think, with the materials that we have available right now to have mesh failures. Thank you.